Chapter 2 The Ides of March The Ides of March had come. Spring was almost here. Octavius was looking for a letter. Each day he was expecting to hear from Julius Caesar that he had left Rome and was on his way to Apollonia. The soldiers, too, waiting on the outskirts of the city, were growing bored with idleness. As soon as the great general arrived, they were to break camp, leave Greece behind, and be off to the east on a fierce campaign against Parthia, Rome's last unconquered enemy. All winter Octavius had been counting the days ahead. This was to be his first real experience in a foreign war. Now, as the time approached, he was almost as excited as on that proud day in Rome two years ago, when he, out of all of his young kinsmen, had been chosen by Caesar to ride beside him in his African triumph. From that glorious day on, Octavius had looked upon Julius Caesar as his guardian and protector, and had dared to hope that, some day, Caesar might make him his adopted son. Of his own father, Octavius had but the haziest memory. His stepfather, though a senator, was not an outstanding man. But this great uncle, Julius, never could he remember when his grandmother's bold, brilliant, fascinating brother had not been his hero. As a small boy, long before he had ever seen him, he knew how Caesar had conquered Gaul, invaded Britain, built the big bridges over the Rhine, and fought back the wild Germans. A later he had dared to cross the Rubicon River with an army, though as governor of Gaul he was forbidden to do so. How he had then marched against his enemies, defeated them all, and became the most powerful man in Rome. Then, before Octavius had seen him, Caesar was gone again, this time to spend the winter with the Queen of Egypt. But the next year, when he was fourteen, the boy had finally met his hero. Caesar had come dashing back to Rome from a brief campaign in Asia Minor. With three short words he summed up his lightning victory, Vini Vidi Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. So he had told them in his tense, exciting voice. Two months later, he was off for Africa and another victory. Octavius was ill, and to his great disgust had to be left behind. But after the African triumph, Octavius had followed Caesar into Spain. And now, in this spring of 44 B.C., he was waiting here in Greece, to go east on what he was sure would be his great-uncle's most magnificent and spectacular campaign. Then, on a day before the end of March, came the shocking news. There would be no campaign. Julius Caesar was dead. A message from his mother brought Octavius word of the tragedy. Her letter had been written on the Ides of March, the very day Julius Caesar had been killed. Killed by his enemies, were her words. But how, thought Octavius, could such words possibly be true? Yet there they were in his mother's familiar writing. And there, too, before him in the open courtyard, was the dust-covered messenger who had made the trip from Rome in record time. He was a free man who had been a former slave in their family. At first sight of his familiar face, Octavius had felt that he brought dreadful news. But this was dreadful beyond belief, beyond imagination. Julius Caesar could not be dead. The boy's throat grew tight, shivering as a damp breeze whipped the folds of his toga against his thin bare legs. He beckoned to Agrippa. Unable to say a word, he held out the letter and watched his friend scan the message rapidly, angry color mounting on his neck. You should go to Rome at once, Agrippa said. His quick mind mapped out a positive course of action. Take command of these legions that are here. March on Rome and wipe out the enemies of Caesar, all of them, whoever and wherever they may be. Many of the officers gave the same advice. 
the loyal soldiers also stood for revenge. As soon as the news spread, as it did like fire, through the town and camp, they were ready to hunt down and kill with their own hands those cowards who had murdered their great commander. Octavius kept a cool head, cautious and not given to rash moves. He was inclined to agree with those who advised him to go slowly, spy out his enemies at first, find out who and where they were, and then have them tried for murder according to the law. Knight found the group of young Romans still discussing various suggestions. One of them, as he spoke or listened, kept watching the light from the boat-shaped lamp about which they were gathered play through the huge emerald in his ring. That was Macinus, the young art collector. Like Agrippa, he was a special friend of Octavius, and about the same age, though possibly he had been wearing the toga of manhood a few years longer. It is highly probable, said Macinus in his smooth, tactful manner, that in his will Julius Caesar has named you his heir. If so, you'll want to return quickly to claim your inheritance. However, if you go about it too quickly, you may lose both your inheritance and your head. Who knows what further plans the enemies may have? All relatives of Caesar may well be in danger. Octavius nodded. He was determined to avenge his great-uncle's death. He intended to claim his inheritance. But at the same time, he also wanted to remain alive. And how should he go about it? That was the bewildering question which he faced. Toward morning, still awake and tossing on his couch, Octavius thought again of the great destiny that the gods were supposed to have in store for him. Unbelievable as it seemed now, he had yet faith that somehow or other the divine plan would be carried out and he would be protected. That faith gave him the courage that he needed. Early in April, he set the day for his departure. First, however, he took great pains to make sure that it was not a date considered disastrous or contrary to the stars to embark upon a journey. Then, finding the auspices favorable, in bearing the good wishes of his friends, Octavius founded a ship and set out alone for Italy. <laughs>